Okay. Hello, everybody. We will wait until 10 o'clock, which is in two minutes. So if you want to grab yourself a glass of water, um, feel free. Hello, everybody. As no doubt you are aware, I like to start the program on time. So it's now 10 o'clock. And I would like to welcome everybody to our popular virtual series, uh, Tuesdays at 10 and Wednesdays at 6.30. And there's just a reminder to those who are attending that we have a few more uh, still to come, one next week and then the following Tuesday. I, I won't be here next week. I will be looking at snowdrops in England but um, the the A and B and C team are all here and they will be making sure that you enjoy Craig's uh, fun and interesting program about tomatoes. And believe me, we all love tomatoes. So I signed up so I could get the recording when I get back. I would just remind everybody that the seed exchange is still packing up seeds to send to those who have ordered them. It's a great way for members to volunteer and begin to know the team. And also you get into see Tyler Arboretum, which is where we do the packing, all right? And it's a beautiful Arboretum. I recommend it even, oh my, on a snowy day, since it's a great day to have a virtual program. If you have not signed up already, please hurry up and do so. Our March into Spring is on March 23rd. Uh, in our continued efforts to collaborate with all of the wonderful horticultural organizations here in Delaware Valley, we are now at Winterthur for this event. And as part of our uh, symposium at Winterthur, the March into Spring, we will also be getting tours of the famous March Bank. These are our speakers at that event. Um, if you haven't heard of them, they are really dynamic and fun and wonderful. We have a marvelous collaboration with the Rock Garden Society uh, in bringing Paul Spriggs to speak about creating crevice gardens. We have a native plant specialist, Uli Lormar coming down from Garden in the Wood. We have Mike Rauch coming from Delaware, not too far, but he is a fun, interesting uh, entomologist. Uh, I've heard him before, you'll love his program, even if you're not so sure about the subject, <laughs> which is of course, invasive insects. And then finally the crutches who, um, you know, they beat the system. They will tell us how they got the HOA and many of us live with an HOA to accept their beautiful native plant garden and how, in fact, they got the laws of Maryland changed 
in order to accommodate that. So I hope you can come uh, to register. You just go to our website. Speaking of our website, oh my, go to the website and look at the calendar of events because you'll have to sit down with a thud. We have so many events coming up this year. Um, I'm exhausted. If I go to all of them, my garden will be weeds. But having said that, there are some great programs. We get to go to all the way up to North Jersey, if you don't mind the schlep, to visit the Garden of Ken Drews. We have a series set up for visiting um, the beautiful Brandywine Cottage Garden of David Culp. Charles Creston is showing his garden. Uh, Jenny Rose Carey is sharing her garden. We have a lot of famous gardeners showing their gardens in as part of our pop-ups. But we also have not so famous, but stunning private gardens in the pop-ups. We have workshops coming up. You'll learn to, to put together uh, troughs in one of them. So check the calendar and check it often. We have a lot of trips on order. We are going to Rhode Island in June and Washington DC in April. Both of those events are full, but we do have an upcoming registration starting tomorrow morning for an overnight trip up to New York City. And there we'll have the opportunity to go to Brooklyn. We're not gonna go to the New York Botanic Garden. We're gonna go to the Brooklyn one and the Brooklyn Bridge Park and the Untermeyer. So, you know, come and uh, join us on that trip. It's a lot of fun and you really get to know the people. And finally, if you love to travel internationally, we are going to Sicily and Rome in September. So please look at the, you can actually see a presentation on that trip on our YouTube channel. Mark your calendars. Our member garden tour is June 29th. We always pick a region in the greater Delaware Valley. This year it is Kenneth Square. At the end, there's a party catered so you can have your dinner with us lots of beverages if it's a hot day, and lots of free plants because our members are digging up and potting. And finally, I'm going to introduce Andrew and then I'm going to disappear. Um, many of us are familiar with Andrew Bunting. He has been in and out of the Delaware Valley for many years. Currently, he is the vice president of horticulture at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society and is gearing up for the Philadelphia Flower Show. He's also a leading expert on magnolias and in fact has written a very um, home gardener friendly book on Plant Lover's Guide to Magnolias. Um, with that, I'm gonna let him do all the talking and stop my share. And at the same time, I'm going to remind folks that they can put their questions in the chat box and at the end, I will return and Andrew will go over the questions, comments, and concerns of our audience. In the meantime, welcome to Hardy. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, I guess this is a great talk for uh, a snowy, uh, wintry day. Uh, so my talk today is on, on uh, magnolias. I do want to say a, a few things before uh we get started do, do want to do just a little overview of of phs and i think uh you know all, all all of you are probably or most of you are familiar with the pennsylvania horticultural society uh but but at, at the kind of heart of what we do we really do uh believe that horticulture can make uh positive social and environmental changes for all, all who engage with it and we really see horticulture in in the broadest sense, and we really do believe that horticulture and gardening uh, belongs to everyone. All all of the work that we do uh, really needs to support these four uh, impact priorities: so creating healthy living environments increasing access to fresh food, building meaningful social connections, and expanding economic opportunity. And so if you look at, you know, the the, the different ways that PHS does its work, whether it's our tree program or community gardens or cleaning, greening vacant lots or public gardens and landscapes, the Flower Show does, many of them support those uh, 
maybe not all four impact priorities, but many of them. And then a few years ago, we created these principles called the principles of gardening for the greater good. And, and you can kind of read these, but we hope that these ideas kind of underpin uh, the work that we do, whether it's the actual work that we're doing in the communities uh, and or through our educational programming, our communications, uh, the flower show, et cetera. I do want to talk just a little bit before we get started on the program about um, the gold medal program. If you go to phsonline.org, uh, you'll see a tab for the gold medal plant program. This is a program that's been going since 1979. We've awarded over 150 plants. There's a committee of about 15 professionals. In fact, we just had a, a meeting yesterday. It's been led by Steve Mastardi at Mastardi's Nursery for the last 30 years. Uh, and what we do is we try to pick tried and true uh, perennials, trees, shrubs, vines, and then we've also added a category of hardy edibles. Uh, for a plant to be a gold medal plant, it has to be ease of cultivation, it has to be ornamental, it has to be available, uh, it has to grow in the mid-Atlantic, and has to have some ecological functions or value to wildlife. So, uh, and there are magnolias on uh, in the gold medal program. So if you wanna see the whole list, which is a searchable database, go to uh, phsonline.org. So today we'll talk about magnolias. And if you have questions and answers uh, or questions, put, put them in the Q and A and I'll answer them at, at the end. Uh, I guess my journey with Magnolia started at the, well, it actually started, I was gonna say it started at the Scott Arboretum. I, I think it really took off there. When I when I grew up in um, uh, high school, I lived in Northern Illinois and we had a kind of a bi-level house and my bedroom actually was kind of candelivered into the canopy of a saucer Magnolia, which you see on the screen here. So that was probably my, first introduction to magnolias. And then when I came to the Scott Arboretum as an intern in 1986, that's when I was really introduced to the, kind of the breadth of magnolias. And the, in my tenure at the Scott Arboretum, which over two different stints was a total of 27 years, we, we curated a collection of what, what is today over 200 different kinds of Magnolias. Uh, this area is, you know, probably one of the best areas maybe in the world for growing magnolias. We can grow lots of the many of the deciduous types. Uh, we can grow many. Uh, well, we can grow all of the North American native magnolias, which I'll talk about. We can increasingly grow more and more evergreen magnolias. So when I got here in '86, even the southern magnolias. Magnolia grandiflores floors were kind of considered marginal. Now all, all of the cultivars are perfectly hardy in, in this area. Magnolia virginiana is reliably uh, evergreen. And then there's some other evergreens we can grow that I have a colleague that just lives next door in Morton and he grows uh, a couple Asian evergreen magnolias including uh, Magnolia insignis and Magnolia uuensis, which are both listed as zone eight, but he has ones that are probably three or four inch uh, caliper. So why don't we get started? Uh, there On the left, you'll see that is my book, Plant Lover's Guide to Magnolias, which is part of a series that Timber Press did, uh, has kind of been discontinued, but you'll probably remember other books in that series like geraniums, epimidiums, sedums, uh, and, and so on. So kind of the overview today was we'll start with native magnolias. We'll go into yellow magnolias. We'll look at the Uland magnolia and Springer magnolia, the saucer magnolias, which are really kind of the, the classic magnolia, the girls as they're called, star magnolias, and then end up with a couple hybrid magnolias. Now there's no way to cover every magnolia in uh 50 minutes or so, 
so this is a nice cross section. Some of these you'll see are, are ones that have been around forever and others are maybe a, a little bit uh, newer, but they are all ones that I know do exceptionally well in the uh, Mid-Atlantic or even more specifically the Delaware Valley. If you want to learn more about magnolias, uh, a great um, nonprofit like the Hardy Plant Society is the Magnolia Society International, and that's magnoliasociety.org. I think membership is around $30, $35. Uh, I'm on the board of the Magnolia Society. In fact, we have our board meeting is coming up this Friday is in uh, Pasadena. So every year we have an annual meeting somewhere. It usually works out like we'll do two or three in the United States, and then maybe the third or fourth one is somewhere internationally. And we've had Magnolia Society meetings in New Zealand, Colombia, Cuba, um, uh, Belgium, England, Poland, uh, Sweden. You wouldn't actually think Sweden is a big Magnolia area, but it's uh, a lot of coastal parts of Sweden, the archipelago of Sweden is actually more like zone six, seven, and they're pretty avid about magnolias. Just a few shots of magnolias in the landscape. On the left is uh, one called Slav and Snowy. A lot of these are taken, you'll notice at the Scott Arboretum. On the right is a Liebnerai type called uh, Vegetable Garden. So let's start with the native magnolias. So. In the United States, I think there's seven species that are that are native. They're almost all, well, they are all native east of the Mississippi. There's a couple like uh, Fraseri pyramidata that goes into Texas. I think Cuminata goes into Oklahoma, but for all intents and purposes, they're east coast species, uh, some like Acuminata is native from Canada all the way down to northern Georgia. Some have a much more specific geographic range, like Macrophylla ashia is only found in five counties in the panhandle of Florida. And then uh, Virginiana goes from uh, Massachusetts all along the coast, all the way down into an into Cuba, and actually in Cuba it has a much bigger leaf, but it is considered Virginiana variety australis. There's actually six other species of magnolias in Cuba that are endemic. So let's start with Acuminata. Acuminata can be a very large tree. It can get up to 100 feet tall, has decent yellow fall color. Uh, the flowers are yellow, however, they're kind of born up in the canopy of the tree, and because they're small and they come out when the leaves come out, they're somewhat inconspicuous. You would grow this if you're looking for a large tree that's na native, but it's important to know when we start to talk about the yellows, the yellow in all the yellow magnolias comes from one parent, which is this, Acuminata. Sometimes it's called the blue magnolia because when it comes out, uh, the, the buds kind of have this bluish cast to it. And then you can see on the right when they op open up. And there are, there are a few cultivars. There's a, a Pierce's Park, which is a selection from Longwood. That's, a, that's an Acuminata. So Acuminata, its attributes are it's native. It actually has a a uh, broad native range from Northern Georgia up into Canada. So it's perfectly hardy to probably zone four, may maybe even three. Those leaves turn a beautiful kind of golden yellow fall color. And then it's really important uh, in hybridizing work as well. Uh, a magnolia that's, I think, uh, loved by many, coveted by many, is Magnolia grandiflora. And I read somewhere recently that Magnolia grandiflora is the most widespread magnolia species in the world. And I, I can attest to that. I've seen it grow throughout different parts of China, uh, all through the United States, California. It's not, it's not hardy in the Midwest 
or, or the Mountain West, although I have seen a specimen at the Denver Botanic Garden. Uh, it's uh, grown all throughout Europe. Uh, I've seen it as a street tree at high elevations in, in Bogota, Colombia. So super versatile tree. Uh, it comes in kind of different types. Uh, I guess at maturity, it's tall and kind of broadly pyramidal. Some of them, like the one on the right, have brown indumentum on the undersides of the leaves. The flowers are born in kind of middle of summer and born sporadically. The flowers are intensely lemony fragrant. They're evergreen. I have one on the side of my house, which is... Um, uh, 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 Edith Bogue, sorry, I almost forgot it because it's kind of considered a, a not important cultivar anymore. Edith Bogue 30 years ago was considered the one that was really hardy. Now they're all, all hardy, including Little Gem. Little Gem is the least hardy of the Southern Magnolias, but it's completely hardy in this area. Now, in fact, I, I've seen Little Gems around over the years that have been really kind of hammered by winter cold and since we haven't had any winter cold they've completely grown out of whatever damage they might have had in the past and they they're really nice looking plants in fact there's two in philadelphia right in front of the franklin institute if you want to see a little gem so there are many cultivars uh this is one of my favorites this is a uh, teddy teddy bear this is down at the bartlett arboretum in charlotte uh if you know greg page he's there for for scale ultimately it does get decent size but that's kind of its ultimate size on the left so maybe 20 feet tall 15 feet wide on the right there's a hedge of it being grown at um uh, stonely um i actually have your on the slide list, I noticed they're out of order. So Dee Dee Blanchard must be next. So sorry for that. Teddy bear is on your list number number three. Uh, but if you want uh, one that's a bit more diminutive, you might consider either uh, this one. There's another one called Baby Grand. We'll look at Kay Paris in, in, in a second. Um, and uh, let, let me just go up. Oh, I see. This is sorry. This one is Dee Dee Blanchard. So they are they are in order. So let, let me go back to Dee Dee Blanchard. Uh, Dee Dee Blanch. The reason I didn't see it is my my tab bar, which I'm sure I can get rid of this somehow, uh, was over over the name. So uh, sorry about that. Dee Dee Blanchard is a is a gold medal uh, selection through PHS. It's one of the best, I think, if you're going to pick a. A Southern Magnolia, I think I would pick this one first. I, I love the brown indumentum on the undersides of the leaves, fast growing. They're all pretty fast growing. I will say that there's the shortcomings are, and I see that with my Edith Bogue uh, at the end of my house, is they constantly drop leaves. I mean, literally, they're dropping leaves, it seems like, uh, 365 days out of the year. So that's that can be messy. They do create an incredible dry shade at the base. So it's not as though you can't grow anything, but over time it becomes increasingly hard to grow um, some plants because of the deep in the dry shade. So just something to be aware of. You can prune them, you can manipulate them. I've seen them grown as espaliers. I've seen them grown into big clipped kind of domes in um, some of the uh, gardens in Italy. And so teddy bear we talked about. And then another diminutive one is Cape Harris. This was selected by um, uh, Magnolia expert uh, Kevin Paris in Spartanburg, uh, South Carolina. It's thought to be a hybrid between Little Gem, so it has those kind of diminutive attributes, and Dee Dee Blanchard. So it's small in stature, only gets about 18 to 20 feet tall with a spread of about maybe six to 10 feet. You can see here it's a spalliate on the left. And then from Dee Dee Blanchard, the parent, it, it has the brown indumentum on the, the undersides of the leaves. So if you like this plant, 
but you don't have a lot of space for the, the big ones. And there's mature ones in the area that are, you know, probably close to 60, 70, 80 feet tall. In fact, uh, Tony Aiello is at Longwood. He and I are, are working on an article for the uh, Harvard or for Arnold Arboretum's Arnoldia on the great uh, Magnolia specimen, Magnolia grandiflora specimens of the area. And there are, even though we've had some really cold winter, there are some uh, magnificent specimens at, at Longwood. There's a few in Media. There's actually a few here in Swarthmore. At Meadowbrook Farm, there's, there's a pair of really large Magnolia grandiflores. And those cuttings came from Upper Bank Nursery in Media, uh, which still exists today as a property, not as, not as a nursery. So there are some some amazing specimens in, in the area. There's a whole series of natives that have large kind of tropical looking leaves. And one is called aptly named the big leaf magnolia, magnolia macrophylla. So this has more kind of a, a south central range. You'll see this in, I've seen it in the wild in Tennessee and in Kentucky, it's grown for its large leaves. It can be up to two feet long. It's large, white, fragrant flowers. The fruits are also fragrant. So the fruits on the right, you'll see, um, will turn kind of to a pinkish color. But I think you'd really grow it for its its bold, tropical foliage. And it can get, it can be kind of gangly. And it can reach probably you know, 40 feet tall in maturity. I saw one recently in a front yard in um, Mount Airy that was really impressive. So you'll see them around. If you know this uh, immediate area, there's an incredible one on the corner of Swarthmore Avenue. So if, you go, if you're in Swarthmore and you're heading towards McDade on Swarthmore Avenue, you'll hit Morton Avenue. On the right, there's one that has a trunk that's probably almost two feet in diameter and the tree must be over a hundred years old. Uh, so if you're in the area, you might wanna check, check that one out. The flowers are fragrant, but they're born kind of sporadically through, through the tree. Now, if you want all the attributes of macrophylla, but want a more diminutive plant, uh, I would suggest Magnolia macrophylla ashii or the ash magnolia only gets about say, maybe 15 to 20 feet tall at maturity with kind of an equal spread, still has a large leaf, still has a large flowers. And because it's smaller in stature, the flowers are more accessible. And then in the center of the flower, you can see here on the right, it has kind of a, a you can't really see it here, but you can see a tint, tint of it. It has a, 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 a purple splotch. Uh, intensely fragrant. I love it for its tropical foliage. You see this one around. And what's interesting is it's native to those five counties of the panhandle of northern Florida. So you might think that it's not hardy here. But what's theorized is it probably had a much broader distribution millions of years ago and was pushed down into northern Florida by the glaciers. And because it maybe had a broader spread, it probably uh, could take colder temperatures. So it just was pushed down there, but the the, the cold hardiness genetics are embedded in it. Uh, we grew it when I was at the Chicago Botanic Garden, so it's, it's hardy there. It's hardy up into Southern uh, Minnesota. Uh, it's around, you know, you kind of have to look for it. Uh, a lot of these, I would say locally, you could probably find it Red Bud Nursery in uh, media, which is um, a retail nursery that only grows native plants. So I would check for it there. Another place is the Tree Authority, uh, which is north of Philadelphia. They have a lot of these as well. And then mail orders. So, you know, Rare Find would be a place to try, uh, you know, and there's a few other mail order nurseries that, that uh, grow these uh, as well. Gossler Farms, I think is still around and, and sells, the, but we'll sell some of these magnolias. They grow a lot of other magnolias as well. It should be noted that magnolias are a, a very old group, group of plants. They're, you know, one of the oldest of the angiosperms. 
And when we talk about pollinators uh, now nowadays, this these are actually pollinated by a beetle. So uh, not by moths or butterflies or, or bees or wasps, but by a, a beetle. Another one for its large leaves. In fact, the largest leaves is the umbrella magnolia, Mag magnolia tripetala. And these leaves can be up to three feet long. Um, so very tropical in its effect. They can get quite big. You'll see these uh, all throughout the Wissahickon. And it's there's some controversy around this plant. Uh, they're not sure if they're native or they're naturalized. So this was a popular plant on estates 100, 125 years ago. So presumably some of those plants have seeded around, but its range actually comes up into kind of Southern, Southeastern Pennsylvania. So the ones you see in the woods, it's, it, it's not clear really to anyone, even the experts, whether it's, part of the native range or that they've naturalized. So just uh, kind of food for thought, I guess. Uh, big flowers as well. This is actually used in some other uh, hybrids to get bit bigger flowered magnolias. Uh, one of its shortcomings is the flowers are fetid, which means they stink. And in this case, they smell like something, something similar to wet gym socks. So you might not want to put this right outside your Front or, front or back door, but you would grow it for its large tropical leaves. Another great native magnolia is Magnolia virginiana variety australis. And this one is um, uh, kind of has two types. There's Magnolia virginiana variety virginiana. There's Magnolia virginiana variety australis. What there isn't but you see this all the time in literature is just Magnolia virginiana. There, it's either variety virginiana or variety australis. So variety virginiana occurs from say uh, Virginia up into Massachusetts kind of following uh, the coastal plains. So you'll see Magnolia virginiana variety australis a lot in the Pine Barrens. It's native on Long Island, Staten Island, and then up into coastal uh, Massachusetts. And then as it goes south, it kind of broadens a little bit. It's still along the coast, but it can go as far inland as kind of low areas of Tennessee and Louisiana, Texas, uh, goes as far west as Texas, goes all the way down into Florida, and as I mentioned, skips into uh, Cuba. The variety Australis one, which is all of the cultivars. And so some of the best cultivars are ones like Green Shadow, Green Bay, uh, selected nearby at the Scott Arboretum is um, Henry Hicks, uh, Satellite, Santa Rosa. All of those are variety australis. All of the ones that are purported to be evergreen are all variety australis. So the attributes of variety australis is that they're, they're evergreen, both types uh, have sporadic flowers starting in May. You can see the flowers on the right. They're kind of a lemony fragrance. Uh, ultimately, the tree will get up to 50 feet tall over time. Sometimes you can buy them as single trunk trees, sometimes as multi-trunked trees. Intensely fragrant flowers, not really a showy flowering plant, but great fragrance and because the flowers are born from May, sometimes till September, you have this great lemony fragrance in the garden. And it's one of the few magnolias I know that can grow in really wet conditions. In fact, in the Pine Barrens, you'll see it growing right on the edge of ponds and lakes. Flowers on the, on the left. Uh, the undersides of the leaves are silvery. So when the wind blows, it catches kind of that, that silvery aspect. If you have, variety virginiana they te it tends to be more uh, deciduous and then the fruits of all magnolias that the it's kind of an aggregate fruit called a follicle there's a little red sing single 
fruit with a seed in it. And all those red uh, fruits or seeds are attractive to uh, ma many songbirds. So it's also good for uh, creating a habitat in the garden. So for many years, the holy grail of the magnolia world was uh, a yellow magnolia. It was theorized that one could be created because I showed you that, that magnolia cuminata, the cucumber magnolia that has those little yellow flowers. So in the uh, 70s, uh, in particular, Lola Cortin, who was um, a hybridizer at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, she and others took combined magnolia cuminata which magnolia, with magnolia denudata, the ULAM magnolia, which I'll show you in a moment, and created the first uh, yellow magnolia, which is Elizabeth. I'll show you that in, in a moment. This one on the left is, is Lois. So I'll cover uh, Elizabeth, Lois, and butterflies, which are truly yellow. Judy Zook is kind of yellow, has kind of yellowy orange um, flowers. Ivory chalice really looks more white, but it, it actually has the same parentage. And then Coral Lake has, really reads as pink, but it has a, a cuminata and it's thought to be spring ride uh, diva is one of the parents. So this was the first one. And this was a huge breakthrough in the Magnolia world. It's kind of a light uh, yellow, uh, really a light, soft sulfur yellow. Flowers are born in profusion. They bloom a little bit later than the earliest magnolias, so they never really run the risk of being frosted. So if the earliest magnolias are like the saucer, or probably the earliest are like the Yulan magnolia, then the star magnolia, then Liebneri, then saucer, then the girls, then these are kind of after all of those. So, you know, typically, you know, I always thought or said that the beginning of the Magnolia season was really around April 1st. Everything's changed now. Uh, but then typically these wouldn't bloom until like May 1st. So almost like a month uh, later. But now everything is, it can be quite a bit uh, earlier. Uh, it does have a soft fragrance. It can get quite big and all the yellows can go, can get quite large because of the Denya date apparent, you know, which reaches up to a hundred feet tall. And then it does have some hybrid vigor because of the two parents crossed together. A lot of hybrids just grow more robustly and more quickly than uh, some of the species. Lois is one of my favorites, has these beautiful tulip shaped flowers, a more intense yellow. It does tend to start to flower as the leaves are coming out, which you can see on the left, but still is a, is a great show. A little bit more stout in its growth uh, still will get, I've seen one at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum that's 35 feet tall, so it will get, you know, fairly large over time, although I think Elizabeth will even get larger than that, as will uh, butterflies. And then this is butterflies. This is a, a plant uh, in uh, Swarthmore on the left. It's the earliest of the yellows to flower. And if there was one yellow with Elizabeth in the 70s, if you were to collect every yellow magnolia today, there's probably, I would guess there's 75 different ones, probably 65, too many, because there's, you know, there's not enough variation amongst the yellows for there to, to, um, to really justify 75 different cultivars. So these are, these are some of my favorites. Uh, I do it like all three of them for di different reasons. Uh, and butterfly is a fairly intense yellow as well. So Magnolia Judy Zook, I like for a number of reasons. I like it because it, it names and honors Judy Zook, who when I came to the Scott Arboretum in 1986, from 86 to 90, she was the director. She went on to be... Um, director and president of the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and then sadly passed away in uh, her 50s from breast cancer. So this for years, 
If you have a magnolia that's BBGRC1164, it's this. And we, we got it originally as that. Ted Kiefer, who's a nurseryman in, in Greenwich, New Jersey, he got cuttings of it as that, grew it as that for years. And then uh, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, when she was retiring, uh, named this in her in her honor. So I, I like it for that reason as much as anything. But it's an interesting hybrid. It has a Stellata rosa, rosia as a, as a parent. It has a Cuminata as a parent. Uh, and I think it has Lilliflora, maybe Rosia as a parent. So you put all those together and it's it's upright, fairly fastidious. It does broaden over time. And it has these flowers. And in the case of all magnolias, the what we would call the petals are actually tepals, which is a modified petal. So the tepals are kind of orangey and you can see at the base of the tepal is kind of pink. And it has this incredible kind of fruity fragrance. Um, so it's, you know, most magnolias are more of a lemony fragrance and this is more of a, a fruity fragrance. So Magnolia Judy Zook. And then this one, this has the same parents, uh, Acuminata times uh, Denudata. This is an ivory chalice, but it really, if you look closely, maybe it has a little yellow in it, but it really reads as white. Um, but it blooms later. It blooms kind of the same time as the, the yellow magnolias. It's a David Leach. Uh, introduction. He was a hybridizer in uh, in Ohio, so it has good hardiness as well. And then this one, this doesn't look like a yellow at all, but it has a cuminata as one of the parents. And then it's thought to have, it was just a chance seedling, so it's thought to have Springer Diva as another parent. And what's important about it is a lot of the pinks, like Magnolia, Liebneri, Letter Messel, Stellata Rosia, all the saucer magnolias, they all bloom relatively early. So they all run the risk of, of coming flowering and then maybe getting frosted. Because of the cuminate apparent, this one blooms quite late. And so it, for all intents and purposes, has a lot of the attributes of, say, a saucer magnolia, but, but blooms late, so rarely uh, risks uh, getting fr frosted. So this is a uh, cor coral lake. This too is at the Scott Arboretum. So another group, and we'll we'll start to go through some more from kind of bloom sequence point of view. So the Ulan magnolia is magnolia denudata, and the Springeri magnolia uh, is magnolia Springeri. And so uh, Denya data is one of the first. There's a couple other rarer species that bloom uh, before uh, Denya data, like Beyond the Eye and Zenii. But uh, Denya data, as far as the more popular ones, is you know probably the first uh, to flower. This is a selection we made at the Scott Arboretum in 1993. We got a seedling, just a tiny little seedling. Magnolia Denya data from J.C. Ralston, and he had gotten the seed from the Beijing Botanic Garden. And we just grew it on th thinking that, you know, if he thought it was good, it, it must be good. I don't think he knew that it, that at least the one he gave us was would be fastidious. He couldn't have known that, but maybe the parent tree in Be at Beijing Botanic Garden was. So we grew it and, and this is, you know, now 31 years later, and it's probably 40 feet tall, has for a denya data, has a very upright habit. Like other denya datas, uh, you can see in the center, those kind of purplish flower parts are the stamens. It's fragrant, uh, super hardy. It's one of the parents, it's the other parent of the yellow magnolia. So all yellow magnolias are cuminata times denya data, and, and maybe in the case of Judy Zook, have something else in, in there. So uh, it's only shortcoming because it blooms early and, and 
you know, nowadays it can bloom, you know, middle of March when it used to typically bloom around the 1st of April, you know, as they bloom earlier and earlier because we're having less uh, cold winters and warmer winters uh, and spring is coming or earlier, then they, all of these more run the risk of getting frosted. But I love denia datas. There's quite a few old denia datas uh, in, in the area. When they're in flower, they're just totally covered in flowers. And a typical denia data is more kind of upright in stature, but will spread out a, a little bit as well. And then really one of the most beautiful of all the magnolias, if you, if you can find it, is Magnolia Spring Arrive Variety Diva Cultivar Diva. There's also one Magnolia Spring Arrive Variety Elongata. E either of them are, are very good. Um, this one, it blooms maybe more like mid-April, I guess. Uh, really just a, a, a beautiful specimen tree. This one is growing at Swarthmore College, both of these pictures. Uh, just one of the most elegant of all the, the magnolias. So what's great about magnolias in general, especially the flowering types, is they flower to, often flower at a young age, and then the flower power just gets better and better with time. And really probably the, the quintessential flowery magnolia, really the best of the best, are the old-fashioned saucer magnolias, Magnolia solangiana. So this has denia data as a parent, which we just looked at, the Yulan magnolia, and that brings in fragrance. And then it has Lilliflora nigra, which brings in kind of the pink, pink flower. And there's many different cultivars. There's some that are, I would say most are kind of pinkish or purplish. There are some, some white uh, cultivars at, as well. Uh, this is just, a lot of them that you see in the landscape are probably just seedling Solangianas, although Sometime when I have more time, uh, I want to drive around, especially Swarthmore. I would say there's three or four distinct kinds, and it would be interesting to know: are they just seedlings, or or maybe they're they're old French cultivars where the names have just been lost? Like that would be interesting to to figure that out. You only have a short window of opportunity to your studies each year, so. Um, but if you just drive around Swarthmore or any older town that, you know, maybe was built around like, like 1880s, 90s, not early 1900s, you know, one of the plants that was used almost in every yard was a, a saucer magnolia. And there's some around here that are probably, I would say 50 feet tall, 50 feet wide. And every single year they have uh, extraordinary flowering. So just some examples here, just big broad spreading branches just covered in flowers. Typically, I would say first week of April, but in you know last five, six, seven years, maybe, maybe as early as mid-March. Here's one called Norbertii at Swarthmore College with softer, lighter pink flowers. This was the first Magnolia hybrid done in um, in uh, France, uh, I think around 1820. So a lot of the cultivars are, are quite old if, if, you, if you can find them. And here's a, a, a small one, Lilliputian. Uh, again, uh, I'm not sure how available this one is. This is only gets about eight to 10 feet tall and really stay, stays pretty small. Uh, for most of its life. So if you just have a small city garden, this might be a good choice. And then uh, the girls. So the girls are um, a hybrid group that was done at the National Arboretum around 1962. And I think there's, there's seven of them that all have girl names. So the last two are, are, are not, not the girls, although I put them in this group because they're closely related. So the girls are, I won't get them all, but Ann, Betty, Ricky, Judy, Susan, Ruth, Pinky, 
they're all they're all supposedly were um uh secretaries at the national arboretum uh, during this period so the parents are stellata rosia times lilliflora nigra which are both kind of shrub like uh magnolias and they um uh they bloom kind of more mid uh, April, typically mid to, I would say second to third week uh, of April. And, um, and then we'll look at galaxy and spectrum, which also have Lilliflora nigra as a parent, but, uh, have other parentage and, and they're much bigger in, in stature. So this one is Anne. So the Scott Arboretum in, in 1962 got, I think a, a few plants of each of these. And so they have a collection of them that are uh, mature specimens now. I would say for most of the years, and so you figure the ones at the Scott Arboretum are about 60 years old. Really for the you know, first few decades, they are more of a large shrub or small tree, only getting say, say eight to 10 feet tall with an equal spread. It's just over time they spread out. So these now are about 18 feet tall and have a spread of about 30 feet. But that's a, over 60 years. They are a good magnolia for a smaller garden because they do have kind of a smaller stature for uh, most of their existence. Really not much fragrance. Depending on the cultivar, they range from like a soft pink to a deeper pink and even kind of a, a purplish pink. And then you can see here's here's Betty. And then uh, another, these also came from the National Arboretum a little bit later, still still the 60s, are Galaxy and Spectrum. So on the left is Galaxy, which I've seen grown as a, a street tree in Columbus, Ohio and other places. So it's kind of an upright, round, kind of oval canopy tree. Typically would bloom second or third week of April. And then on the right uh, this is Spectrum. So Spectrum is a sister seedling of Galaxy, just a little bit more open in habit, and then the flowers are more open as well. So, you know, if you like kind of the blousy flowers of Spectrum, that's an option. But if you want something a little bit more tight in its habit, then you might consider Galaxy. And then the, the star magnolia. So, um, uh, Magnolia Stellata Centennial, Chrysanthemum of Flora, and then we'll look at Magnolia uh, Len Leonard Messel. So one of the best is Stellata Centennial, which was selected by the Arnold Arboretum in 1962 to co commemorate their centennial uh, anniversary. It's a gold medal plant. It's about 18 to 20 feet tall, good fragrance. They do bloom early, so both the saucer magnolias, which you can see in the left frame, and the Stellata Centennial on the right, both always run the risk of getting frosted in the spring. One that I like for intense flower power is Magnolia Stellata Chrysanthemuma flora. And uh, this is just, I think each flower has, I think like 70 tepals, and has a really strong pink. Again, slightly fragrant as well. And then Magnolia Leonard Messel, it's actually a Liebneri. And Liebneri is a hybrid between a Stellata and Cobus. And Cobus is just a, a more tree-like uh, star magnolia. This is, I put this in one of my top, top 10. Uh, blooms early with the stellatas, a little bit more tree-like, getting maybe 15 feet tall, 15 feet wide in maturity. Uh, you can see it, the undersides of the flowers are, are more intense pink than the top side, but it does read as pink in the landscape, slightly fragrant. And then I'll just add, end with uh, just a couple hy hybrids. There's many, many, many hybrids. Um, uh, and, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about, uh, Magnolia cuensis first at the flower on the left is Magnolia Soboldi. I know, show you that again. 
So again, top 10, I would put Magnolia cuensis, Water's Memory, very upright and oval for most of its decades. And then over time, like the big one at Winter Tour does broaden out over time. Blooms early, fragrant flowers, fast growing, lots of flowers, upright. The parents are um, uh, Magnolia denia data times salicifolia. So it actually the habit is more salicifolia like. It is available as well in the trade. Close up of the flowers. So you can see fairly young plant on the left is covered in flowers. So just you know, really elegant plant and um uh you know great flower power. Really, if you buy one that's a year or two old, you'll even have flowers on it. And then I just want to finish with these two. So Magnolia Saboldii is a species. Uh, it has great hardiness. It has these like pure alabaster white flowers with a boss of purple stamens in the center. Um, it's shrub-like, but it's been being used in a lot of newer hybrids. So a new holy grail in Magnolia world is to create a, a hardy or hardier uh, Magnolia grandiflora that can grow in the Midwest. So this is one that was on the right was uh, hybridized by uh, Dennis Ledvina, who is a Magnolia hybridizer in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And his goal was to take a lot of the Magnolias that were did well on the East Coast and just make hardy versions of them. So exotic star for all intents and purposes looks like Magnolia grandiflora, has larger flowers, even maybe more fragrant with a purple center. Uh, this probably needs some more work, maybe some more hybridizing with Saboldii, because Saboldii, each time you do a, a hybridize it or, or back cross it, it brings out more and more hardiness. So there's probably more work to be done with uh, Exotic Star. And then just finish up with a, a few lists. So Great Magnolias for the Small Garden, Teddy Bear, K. Paris, Ashii, Lilliputian, The Girls, The Stars, Leonard Messel, and Saboldii. Great Fragrant Magnolias, all the Grandifloras, Macrophylla Ashii, Virginiana, Judy Zook, that's the one that has the kind of fruity fragrance and is pictured on the left. Any Denudata, Springeri, all the Saucer Magnolias, Cuensis, and Saboldii. Evergreens, Grandifloras, Virginiana, there are others, and that's that'll be part of the new front, frontier with Magnolias is uh, there will be more and more evergreen Magnolias. There's also work being done with uh, Tom Rainey, who's a famous plant hybridizer in near Asheville is working on creating a pink Magnolia grandiflora. So that's on the horizon. They're also working on creating more shrub-like uh, evergreen magnolia. So things that might, you know, be a new good broadleaf evergreen shrub, especially for our, our area. And then the natives. Uh, the natives I didn't cover are Fraser eye which is up in the Appalachian Mountains and Fraser I Pyramidata, which is the Southern coastal plain from the Panhandle of Florida to Eastern Texas. So I'll finish there. I do have, I believe I have some uh, flower show images. So I wanted to finish just, uh, I know probably all of you, hopefully all of you are going to the flower show. So this year's theme is, uh, United by Flowers, uh, March um, 2nd to the 10th. Oops. Oh, I did that. Hold on. Uh, so, you know, we've been around since 1829. Uh, the Flower Show, the Port Society has actually been around since 1827. We'll have major exhibits, floral, competitive classes, the vendor area. Some sketches or renderings of what you might see on the right will be the PHS entrance garden, which will actually have the largest uh, water feature of 
at any previous flower show. We'll have lots of activities, the potting parties, butterfly lives, kids cocoon. We have a new lecture series this year called Know to Grow. So every day we'll have three free lectures. So if you have a ticket to the flower show, go to uh, phsonline.org, click on the flower show tab, go to events and go to Know to Grow and it'll list all the lectures uh, for each day. And if you're a member, you get an, a bonus lecture because every day in the members lounge, there's a, a another lecturer. And then, as you know, there's other ways to support PHS. Uh, if, you, if you're not a volunteer PHS or still want to be a volunteer at the Flower Show, there's still opportunities for that. I was talking to Nora and others before, and uh, they're both volunteering at the, at the Flower Show. So with that, I will thank you, and we'll open it up for questions. Great presentation and a number of questions and comments. Um, I see that one of our water gardening SIG leaders is reminding folk that there's still time to sign up for their event with Carl Gerson. Uh, please go to our website. It's on February 25th if you're interested and would like to attend that event. Um, at any rate, some Carol. Uh, hello, Carol Smith. Uh, she wrote, this is a perfect day to have a Tuesday at 10. She just got done shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, first real question about magnolias. Have you had any success with planting under the magnolias because they give such dry shade? And what do you recommend? Yeah, I would say, you know, when especially the deciduous types, when the, when they're small, you know, you can plant underneath them. I, I would say over time with all magnolias, because they're fairly surface rooted, you're going to want to do things that can take dry shade, like, you know, many of the ferns or epimidiums, hellebores, acerums, you know, all, all of those would be good. Okay. Um, next question. How do you feel about pruning magnolia for height, creating a multi-stem rather than a single stem. Some of these yellow ones would be so much nicer if they could see the flowers. <laughs> or are there more dwarfs or shorter versions you know about? Yeah, I would say, pr so magnolias typically should be pruned dur during the season and not so much during the dormant times of the year. Although magnolia grandiflora can really be pruned at, at any time. Every time you prune a magnolia, you will get it'll it'll cause these shoots along the stems called epicormic shoots. So I would say only prune to do corrective prune. I wouldn't try to prune to turn it into something that's it's it doesn't really want to be like a like a shrub because you're always going to have all this interior growth that's uh um uh that um you know, we'll just make it kind of messy looking. It'll be fighting back, in other yeah. words. Uh, as far as smaller yellow magnolias, I would say Lois, at least in the first 15, 20 years, is fairly compact. It does get, it does kind of get bigger over time, but does it does stay relatively compact. Okay. So this question was mine, uh, I'm full disclosure to everybody. With you've mentioned in a couple cases plants that have the same parents, but I'm curious: is it the same mother plant and different and same pollen, or do you switch it? Sometimes? Yeah, they can they can be switched. I think with the yellows, uh, you still end up with a yellow, whether accumulate as the you know receiving the pollen or giving giving the pollen. But yeah, they right. they go back and forth. So like Tom Rainey who you probably many of you have heard lecture he he's part of North Carolina State University when he does a breeding program he'll he'll go both you know uh accumulated times denudated denudated times accumulated like he has these long lists of all all the cross that crosses that he wants to make okay uh a question in the Delaware Valley can you mention do you know of any good nurseries that uh, uh, sell the yellows particularly? Uh, I would, you know, I would try, 
you know, Mastardis, Gateway, uh, Primax, Moranos, you know, that all, all right. of those would be good. Uh, tri Triple Oaks, probably in New Jersey. Right. And then, you know, Rare Find, uh, while it's mail order, you can also go there and buy. Yeah. Mac so that's as far as like the broadest range, you know, probably Rare Find. Although, uh, also, I know um, the Tree Authority has some yellow magnolias also. All right. Good to know. Huge. Oh. Uh, just an observation, there it is a huge saucer magnolia at the historic colonial era Trent House in Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. It is enormous. Yeah, great. Uh, Thank you. All right. Um, can you recommend shade tolerant magnolias? Yeah, probably the ones that are, I would say all the, the big leaf magnolias are understory plants in their natural habitat. So Ashii, Macrophylla, Tripetala, actually Grandiflora, uh, Grandiflora uh, can grow in, in quite a bit of shade. Okay. Uh, I would say all the others, you know, more of the hybrid types, they could probably grow in the shade, but you're going to forego kind of flower power in the shade. Right. Okay. Um, we have a member up in Londonderry, Vermont, <laughs> uh, near Manchester, and he's wondering if... Do you think that there are, what are the best varieties for growing in zone five? Yeah, so I'd say the saucer magnolias are zone five. That's Langeana, star magnolia, stellata, Leib, the Leibneri, Leonard Messel, uh, probably most of the yellows. Like okay. I know Elizabeth and butterflies are pretty cold hardy. That ivory chalice, which I mentioned, is pretty pretty hardy. A uh, Seboldii would be worth uh, trying. I would even try, um, you know, Macrophylla ashy. I might be borderline up there, but uh, worth, worth a try. And then the gir the girls, so Anne and Betty and kind of that, that group. Oh, so quite a, quite a, a, yeah. a, a list. All right. Um, a question. Are some of the categories of magnolias effective as cut flowers? Yeah. Uh, y yes. So y years ago, uh, I don't know, at least 15 years ago, I was asked to uh, be on Martha Stewart's show. So I cut I cut a bunch of magnolias, put them in a, in, a, in a big upright container, put them in my car, drove up to Connecticut, and she did a whole episode on magnolia flowers, you know, is cut branches. So they were they were cut branches with the flowers already out. I think it's, you could probably force them into flowering, but I think they'll be more effective cutting them while they're in flower. Got it. Um, there's an observation about Magnolia biondii. Uh, varying reports have hardiness down to minus 13 Fahrenheit. Is that worth growing in this area? Yeah, there's a, Biondii blo can bloom really early. So the, I also mentioned Zenii blooms er, early. Uh, there's a Beyondii at the Scott Arboretum that's actually quite old. It's probably 40 years old or so. J just know that it's going to be vulnerable to cold weather. So you, if you can give it maybe, you know, protection of a courtyard or a little alcove, you know, next to your house, that that might be ideal. All right. So here's a uh, Carol. Rachek said, my what is memory flowers pretty much droop like wet handkerchiefs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Why might that be? Although it smells really nice, lemony. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the flowers are, you know, the, the teeples are long and they, they do kind of hang down. I, I don't know why hers hang down more so than the ones I, I, I've seen. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, just an observation that not all epimediums care for dry shade and that there is a very good website, epimediums.com, well, for okay. details you know, on which ones yeah. are not going to do well. Uh, thank you, Laura, for that. And then finally, a question, a comment about Magnolia Stella Ruby. Do you so, some feedback, thoughts and comments? Yeah, I, I've seen it. There's one at the at the Scott Arboretum. I don't, I don't know 
much much about it. I don't I don't even know what the parents are. I think it's an early flowering one. I I I I'm guessing that maybe it has stellata as a parent, but I'll I'll have to look into that. I I, I don't I don't know yeah. much about that. The name suggests it, certainly. <laughs> All right. And there's been a lot of feedback about what a wonderful presentation this has been. For those who go to our YouTube channel, Andrew has very graciously agreed to let us also post this on our YouTube channel, which we will do in due time. So thank you all. Happy shoveling. In the meantime, dream of magnolias. <laughs> uh, and see you all at a Zoom program. Yeah. Thanks Bye. for having me. Thank you so much, Andrew. Yeah, you're welcome.